what do you feel about the, uh, the Turing test as a as this modality to distinguish uh, general uh, artificial intelligences? Well, let's begin by asking what Turing thought about it. So if you look back at his famous 1950 paper on machine thinking, he says, the question whether machines can think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. Okay, that's what Turing thought about it. He thought that the imitation game, as he called it, could be a useful device for stimulating better construction of machines, of software, and so on. And he said it might in 50 years, he guessed, uh, modify the way we think about thinking. But it's the question whether machines can think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. It's kind of like asking whether submarines can swim. You want to call that swimming? Okay, they can swim. Uh, in fact, languages differ in this. In some languages, airplanes fly, and other languages, they glide. You know, that's uh, an uninteresting conventions. Now, you take the Turing test itself and go back to the 17th century, the origins of modern science. Now, they had something like the Turing test. Uh, Descartes asked the question, he was part of this Galilean challenge, he was Galileo and many others. And Descartes asked, uh, how can a person uh, carry out the normal creative use of language. You know what to say in particular circumstances. You're producing sentences constantly, which are novel. You never heard them before, nobody ever heard them before, but others can understand them. They're appropriate to situations, but they're not caused by situations. You could have said something else. So it's not, as they put it, uh, you're you're inclined to say certain things, but not impelled. Uh, and then some of his followers, Jacques de Cordemois, another Cartesian, proposed tests, experimental tests. He said, suppose there's another creature that looks like us. We want to find out if he has a mind like ours. So we run experiments uh, to ask him, uh, would he say the kind of thing that's appropriate in particular circumstances. That's the Turing test. But it was different in the 17th century. There it was science. For them, remember, it's a question of existence. There's a mind, which is a thing in the world. There's a body, which is a thing in the world. We want to know whether another creature has the mind. It's like asking, does he have a liver? You know? It's asking a question of the physical sciences. That's right. But for the Cartesians, for the Galileans, the analog of the Turing test, it's a straight scientific question. For Turing, it's not a scientific question. Mm. It's a way of stimulating your imagination or something mm. like that. Thought expression. So in a way, the 17th century tests were much more serious. Mm. You know, your computer that tells you something, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if Alexa helps you to think of something, who cares? But there's no science involved. Right. Is that uh, is that a parlay with or you know um, dovetail with your well-known views on the Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink project? It feels so real. Yeah, it feels very real. But but it's it's this, these are all uh, impulses from neurons. Uh, where you've said that, you know, trying to move your arm, uh, you know, uh, with a neuro embedded chip like Neuralink is perhaps feasible at some point. But to find out what you're thinking, uh, there seems to be, you claimed in, in 2018, I believe, that there's no way to do that because we don't understand how to proceed. And I think that, I don't think your views have changed much, right? Only that, we don't even know if we're looking at the right thing. How so? Thinking may not involve neural nets. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's pretty good reason to believe that it doesn't. Uh, neural nets, for one thing, are neur neural transmission is pretty slow, as we were, you know, by the relevant criteria. By the criteria of what we were talking about before, how rapidly you think. By that criterion, as known back to Helmholtz, in fact, the neural transmission is pretty slow. Furthermore, neural nets don't have the right, the right architecture. You have to 
what we need is something like touring architecture, something that has basically the control unit of a touring machine, you know, right, dress, and so on. Uh, you can't do that in the world maps. They just don't have the right properties. You know, that's why Stuart Hameroff, who you mentioned before, is uh, looking at things like microtubules, uh, things in the, the internal structure of the neuron, which has vastly more computing power. You know, Roger Primrose is working on this. The main work on it was done by uh, Randy Galliston, a very good neuroscientist, who's done very interesting work arguing what I just said, I'm just quoting him, that the neural net systems are just the wrong place to look. They don't have the kind of architecture which is involved in thinking. We have to find something else. It might turn out to be at the molecular level, at the level of RNA. You know, molecular level, you're really getting massive com possibilities of computation. So maybe just duplicating a neural net will tell you nothing, because you're not looking in the right place. We don't know. I mean, the thing to do is do the science first, then worry about the engineering.